All right, so, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm in a difficult spot of being the last person uh, standing between you and uh, dinner, um, but thanks for sticking around for the last session. I'm excited to tell you about uh, differentially private password frequency list and uh, other applications. Um, so to start off, uh, what do I mean when I talk about a password frequency list? Um, so up here we have our initial data set, uh, which is just a collection of users, um, and you know, some of the passwords that they may or may not have uh, selected. Um, then, of course, from this data, we can uh, um, abstract it further and uh, produce a histogram. Uh, so here, ABC123, uh, we have frequency two, um, and frequency one for other passwords. Um, and then we can abstract it one level for, uh, further, and uh, we can just uh, you know, delete the passwords from the list, uh, and uh, this is the final frequency list. Uh, so when I talk about a password frequency list, um, I'm just talking about a list of numbers uh, in descending order. Um, so formally, it's just a partition of the number n, where n is the total number of users. Um, okay, so why would we want uh, to have a password frequency list? Uh, well, uh, password frequency lists can be uh, tremendously valuable for security researchers. Um, for example, I can define the statistic uh, lambda beta, which is just uh, the number of accounts. Whoa. Did I step on something? Ah, okay. And there it's back. Uh, all right. Uh, so lambda beta is just uh, simply the fraction of user accounts that would be broken uh, by an attacker who can try beta guesses per user. Um, so when beta is small, let's say uh, you know, 10, you can think of an online attacker that's just trying to repeatedly uh, log into your account. Uh, when beta is large, you can think of an offline attacker who's already breached the authentication server and has access to the password hash. Um, so that's just one simple statistic. Uh, of course, you know, once you have the frequency list, you can do lots of more sophisticated analysis. Uh, for example, uh, you know, from the frequency list, you could compute marginal guessing costs or marginal guessing rewards for an attacker. Um, you could you know, try to figure out when a rational attacker might stop guessing each password. You know, if he's rational, he'll stop when marginal guessing costs exceed marginal reward. Um, so you know, these are some of the reasons why you might want to have a, a password frequency list. Um, so let's look at some of the password frequency lists that are available. Um, so this is you know, back from 2015. Uh, so Rock U, uh, back in uh, um, well, back in 2009, uh, decided to donate uh, 32.6 million uh, user passwords for science. Um, and by donate, I mean they chose to use the identity function to hash their passwords and not protect against the SQL injection attacks. Um, there's, of course, other examples of data breaches. Uh, LinkedIn was breached uh, initially, you know, back in 2015, uh, you know. It was estimated that there were six uh, million user accounts affected by that breach. Uh, we'll see later that uh, estimate has increased quite a bit. Uh, and there's you know, some more Chinese uh, breaches and other breaches I could add to this list, but it's not meant to be a complete uh, listing of breaches by any stretch. Um, okay, so let me tell you now about the Yahoo uh, um, password frequency list. Um, so this list was collected uh, by um, a Yahoo intern uh, back in 2011, uh, Joseph Bonneau, um, and it was collected with permission. Um, so basically what they allowed him to do, um, anytime a user logged in over, I think it was a 24 hour period, uh, they would hash the password and they would append a long random salt value to that password before hashing it. Um, so you know, after um, data collection, they discard the secret salt value um, so now basically you can test you know, two hashed passwords for equality. You know, if hash one is equal to hash two, then those users selected the same password. So essentially what this gives you the ability to do is to construct a password frequency list. It doesn't allow you to uh, decrypt the passwords you know, unless you have that secret salt value, which uh, if you trust them, they, uh, they discard it. Um, so the, the list includes data from 70 million or approximately 70 million Yahoo users. Um, and Yahoo Legal actually gave uh, Bono permission to collect this data set uh, and to publish some analysis of this data set uh, in a 2012 Oakland paper. Um, so really kind of the origin of this project, uh, you know, as a password researcher, um, yeah? Can you go back 
Sure. So he was allowed to store. Um, so, uh, okay, right. same salt. So, so it was the same salt value for every user. Um, so if that server had been breached within that you know 24 win, 24 hour interval and that salt value had been you know hadn't been discarded yet, then that could have been bad. I agree. Um, but uh, you know. At least it appears that they weren't breached during that time, uh, to the best of to the best of our knowledge. Uh, so you know this seems to be a safer way to um, to perform the data collection. Right. Um, but from my perspective, uh, you know I'm less interested in you know how the data was collected. Mm -hmm. Now that we have it, uh, can we actually do something with it? Right, but I guess the point, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, the only thing that was collected was the frequency. Levels. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, along with some other demographic information, uh, you know, they had. Uh, um, okay, so that, okay, so okay. Uh, to clarify. Uh, okay, to, okay. To clarify, you know, they stored the hash of the salt and password. They had like name, or they no, they didn't have name. Uh, good grief. Uh, no, no names. Uh, just basic demographic information like uh, you know age. Uh, uh, you know, language, uh, you know, number of years with a Yahoo account. Uh, so they had some, some other type of demographic information associated with these lists. Uh, um, so potentially you could, you know, partition the list, you know, based on uh, different subsets of the features. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that's, that's all you could do. Uh, okay, so kind of how this project gets started, uh, right, I'm a young uh, researcher working on password security. Um, here's this nice uh, data set, uh, you know, um, it would be nice to have access to it. Uh, so, you know, I reached out to um, Joseph Bonneau, sent him an email and, you know, hey, is it possible to access or, or share the data? Um, you know, I'm working on this cool new research project, blah, 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 um, and this data would be really useful. Um, and his response was, well, I would love to make the data public. Uh, but Yahoo Legal has concerns and they basically won't let me uh, release it. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, I was sad at the time and, you know, this ended the conversation temporarily. Um, but this is, you know, a workshop on overcoming barriers to data sharing. So, you know, if this was the end of the story, I wouldn't be up here talking to you right now. Um, okay, so uh, excited to, tell you that uh, yes, Yahoo did eventually give us permission uh, to release this, uh, these you know, password frequency lists uh, using differential privacy. Um, and of course, you know, since it's differentially private, uh, that means that we aren't, aren't releasing the original data that uh, Bino collected. Um, slightly per perturbed version of it and I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about how the data was perturbed and you know, maybe how much error was introduced uh, during that process. Oh, um, if you are interested in downloading it, it's also uh, available. Here's a link. Um, you could also Google for Yahoo Password Frequency Corpus. That's probably an easier way to, um, to find it than uh, memorizing this long URL. Um, okay, so uh, I used to make the claim that this was the largest publicly available uh, you know, password frequency corpus. Um, Unfortunately, I can't really make that claim anymore. Um, so LinkedIn upgraded their uh, estimate. Uh, this is you know, 167 million. Um, Yahoo, uh, in a completely unrelated event, uh, was breached not once, uh, twice. Uh, and actually, it affected all 3 billion. Yes, retroactively. Uh, so uh, yeah, it affected all uh, 3 billion accounts. Um, so I'm sad to say someone, or someone somewhere out there may have a larger frequency corpus than I do. Um, but uh, you know, if you don't want to go on the dark web to find uh, those frequency lists, uh, I can at least say that uh, you know, this is the largest ethically released uh, yeah. you know, password frequency corpus uh, you know, that wasn't the result of a data breach. Yes. Um, okay. So. Uh, that brings us to another question, which is one I get asked a lot. Uh, so why not just publish the original uh, password frequency list? Uh, and one, I guess, pragmatic reason is, uh, right, Yahoo Legal wouldn't allow it. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, differential privacy was really the difference for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, on another level, uh, stepping back and, uh, you know, this is an audience uh, that's very familiar with uh, many of these attacks, but, uh, you know, heuristic approaches to data privacy have a long history of uh, being broken, uh, right? So there's the infamous uh, Netflix prize data set where you correlate with IMDB um, and you're starting to, you know, re-identify users in that uh, supposedly uh, de-anonymized uh, data set. Of course, there's the, you know, Latanya Sweeney's famous uh, um, group insurance example uh, where you're able to identify many of the users from, uh, you know, zip code, uh, gender, and date of birth. Um, so, you know, there's a large history, a long history of, uh, you know, heuristic approaches to data privacy failing. Um, and, uh, you know, given uh, an absence of provable privacy guarantees, I would say that it was actually fairly reasonable for Yahoo Legal to, um, to take a conservative standpoint and, uh, you know, not release this data um, unless they had some sort of provable privacy guarantee. Um, so just, uh, you know, a quick example of some of the security risks. Um, so, you know, initially this might seem like a contrived example. Suppose the attacker knows, uh, you know, all of the user's passwords except for one. Um, and now we have three possible uh, frequency lists uh, that we could generate. Uh, in this world, we know that uh, Alice's password was ABC123. In this world, we know that it's 12345. And in this world, we know that it's something else. Um, so in this case, you know, the attacker combining his background knowledge uh, with the output frequency list actually infers someone's password exactly. Um, okay, uh, good. So, uh, you know, in fact, uh, you know, this might seem like a lot of background knowledge for the attacker to have, but given that Yahoo has been breached, uh, you know, maybe, uh, um, maybe a model of the attacker where the attacker does have lots of uh, background knowledge is actually, you know, a realistic one. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, differential privacy, you know, by this point in the day, we've seen this uh, definition uh, many times. Let me just highlight a few of the, you know, unique features to, to our setting. Um, so in this case, uh, we're defining a differentially private algorithm to release a password frequency list. Um, and we'll say that two frequency lists, F and F prime, are neighbors if uh, their L1 distance is one. Um, right, so if, you know, Alice removes her password from the data set or, um, you know, if we add a new user to the data set, uh, you know, that's a neighboring, neighboring partition. Um, and, right, of course, yeah, L1 dish distance is just, you know, the sum of uh, Fi, where Fi is the um, frequency of the ith most popular password. Question? What about the, the demographic information that you mentioned was there as well? How does that... Um, so we'll get back to the demographic information later. For now, I'm just uh, um, ignoring the fact that the, the demographic information exists, and uh, let's just pretend that we discarded it. Uh, we'll we'll reincorporate that uh, later um, and talk about partitioning epsilon. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, for now, uh, let's just ignore demographic uh, demographic information. Um, okay, so yeah, F is the original password frequency list, and you can think of F prime as being the password frequency list after Alice removes her, her password from the data set. Um, and in our case, uh, we used uh, epsilon equals half uh, as our uh, cumulative or aggregate uh, privacy, privacy value. Um, and of course, when you pick delta, you know, we want it to be negligibly small. So we do have a delta. Um, theoretically, you know, delta was uh, something like two to the minus 100. Um, okay, so just, uh, I mean, quick example of the promise of differential privacy, right? Uh, if we have initial uh, frequency list and then uh, neighboring frequency list, you know, the probability that Alice uh, gets hacked, uh, you know, think of S as being the subset of all outcomes that are harmful to Alice. You know, the probability of an outcome in this harmful set doesn't change too much, uh, you know, whether or not Alice's data was, was present. Um, now, I want to be careful here um, because I'm not promising Alice that her, you know, that she's not going to be hacked, uh, right? So, uh, you know, maybe Alice picked a weak password, uh, maybe uh, due to reasons outside of our control, you know, her account's still going to be hacked. I'm just promising Alice that 
if she's hacked, she won't be hacked because her password was included in the data when we released this uh, password frequency list. Okay, so uh, kind of main summary of the technical results. Uh, so there's a computationally efficient algorithm uh, which uh, takes as input an integer partition. Oh, this is, okay, it just takes as input one integer partition, uh, outputs a partition, and uh, preserves epsilon delta differential privacy. Um, the L1 error, uh, normalized by n, the number of users, uh, scales with one over epsilon times root n, at least in the upper bound, uh, uh, plus this, you know, ln one over delta factor. Uh, the running time is proportional to n root n over epsilon, and similarly, the space requirement is proportional to n root n over epsilon. Um, so just, uh, um, okay, right, uh, p is the set of all part you know, all integer partitions, uh, right? So we don't want to publish the number of users, exact number of users in the data set. Uh, so P is just the set of all partitions of some number. Okay. Uh, good. Um, so, right, uh, we have an algorithm that uh, basically is uh, releasing an output uh, partition, uh, which is fairly close to, uh, to the original in terms of L1 distance. Um, now, the key uh, tool here is the exponential mechanism. Uh, so basically, the exponential mechanism says, you know, given an input f um, and a possible output f twiddle, uh, we're going to um, output f twiddle with probability proportional to the, you know, e to the minus uh, f minus f twiddle, um, just measure the L1 distance there. Um, and basically, the idea here is that we're assigning very small probability to inaccurate uh, outcomes. Um, so, right, uh, the exponential mechanism is well known to preserve uh, differential privacy. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, Hardy and Ramanujan showed back in 1918 that uh, there's roughly e to the root and uh, integer partitions. Uh, so that means that if you just take a union bound, you get, uh, you know, our error rates uh, with, uh, with high probability. Um, right, okay, so we have accuracy and privacy. Um, but now the challenge is uh, efficiency, right? Uh, thanks. Uh, so um, there's a long line of uh, research kind of uh, looking at the computational complexity of, uh, you know, running differentially private mechanisms. Um, and to summarize these all in one slide, uh, you know, one can say, you know, one does not simply just run the exponential mechanism, right? We're assigning weights to, um, in this case, infinitely many uh, different outcomes. Uh, you know, how do you actually sample from such a distribution? Um, but uh, the key point is, you know, we were able to actually run the exponential mechanism, or um, I should be more precise, uh, we were able to approximately run the exponential mechanism. Uh, so here, uh, our main result is that there's an efficient algorithm A, uh, which approximately samples from the exp exponential mechanism. Um, and the key intuition here is to use dynamic programming. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, this uh, e to the minus uh, epsilon term in, uh, um, in, right, so yeah, if we, if we look at this term, it naturally separates out into, into the product of two uh, different terms. So that kind of suggests a recurrence relationship that might be exploitable by uh, dynamic programming. And I'm not gonna have time to go into the technical details uh, um, but, you know, this uh, relationship naturally suggests uh, dynamic programming. Right, uh, so we use dynamic programming to basically compute the weights, uh, and the weights really give us a way to, you know, compute the probability of, uh, you know, an individual uh, component of our output frequency list. Um, and, of course, the problem with this dynamic programming algorithm is we still have you know, infinitely many possible outputs. Um, so the second idea is that uh, we're going to allow our algorithm to ignore um, an output partition if it's, you know, too far away from the input partition. This is where we get the epsilon delta guarantee. So we're just gonna cut off part of the space um, and then run our, uh, you know, simulate the exponential mechanism on this uh, restricted space. Um, okay, uh, so, 
you know, in this talk, I wanted to highlight a few of the practical challenges here. Uh, so space is in particular one of the big limiting factors. Uh, so in our case, you know, n was about 70 million. Um, and in some of the experiments we were running, epsilon was about 0 0.02, uh, which means if you look at, you know, n root n over epsilon, uh, and you have, you know, an eight byte, uh, um, you know, double our floating point value in each, uh, for each of these weights, that's about uh, 200 te terabytes just to store the dynamic programming table, um, right? So, uh, you know, if you try running this on your laptop like I did, uh, you know, you're quickly gonna run out of space. Um, so the workaround here um, is that you can actually execute an, in an initial pruning phase to kind of trim the size of your DP table, identify regions of the DP table that aren't, just aren't going to be relevant, and after doing this, you can actually reduce the size of this table to something that uh, you can manage, manageably run on your, on your laptop. Um, and, you know, it was actually uh, on this laptop uh, that I uh, ran the code, uh, right? So this took about uh, 12 hours uh, for this uh, particular instance. I had to let it run overnight. Uh, so, you know, time is a limiting factor, but it's definitely uh, feasible. Um, okay, so challenge two, uh, the weights can actually get very large, uh, right? Uh, you know, this, we've got this dynamic programming table and, uh, you know, filling in the values with this recursive formula. These weights are very large. Uh, in fact, they can start to overflow, uh, you know, the native floating point types in uh, C sharp. Um, so the workaround here, um, instead of storing the weights, uh, we were actually able to store the logarithms of the weights, uh, and that allowed us to actually, uh, you know, compute the DP table um, and store the weights in a meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Um, so another important implementation question we had to deal with uh, was where do the random bits come from? Uh, so this sampling algorithm, it's outputting, you know, a very long list of numbers, um, and there's a lot of random bits that, uh, that are necessary as part of the input. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, as a cryptographer, you realize, uh, okay, I probably shouldn't just use the default, uh, you know, JavaScript RAND, or in this case, uh, C sharp, C -sharp uh, RAND uh, function. Uh, but it turns out, uh, you know, the crypto um, uh, random number generator uh, is a little bit more difficult to, to use, um, right? So some of the um, you know, native operations like next double, for example, um, just don't exist uh, for uh, crypto RAND. Um, so there's a little bit of work to actually, uh, you know, use a crypto, uh, cryptographic random number generator here. Um, but that is an important, uh, important point uh, because if you are using, uh, you know, the native uh, random number generator, then what you actually get out is not differentially private. In fact, uh, well, technically, what we got out was still not differentially private. It was computationally differentially private, uh, right? So if an attacker can infer, um, you know, whatever uh, key was being used to generate, uh, you know, to generate uh, this uh, output, then potentially they would be able to, um, to recover the original, original data set. Um, and then finally, uh, the big challenge here, uh, right? Uh, um, so before we're releasing it, uh, we have to have the discussion, what's epsilon going to be? Um, so, you know, I reach out to Joseph Bino, uh, you know, do you have any preference for epsilon? Uh, and, uh, you know, Yahoo basically, you know, emails back, well, you know, are there standardized guidelines to selecting epsilon? Um, and, yeah, uh, I didn't really have a great answer, uh, no. Um, but, uh, you know, I was able to come up with, you know, epsilon equals a half and, you know, suggest this might be a reasonable, uh, reasonable value in this, uh, in this setting. Uh, one of the reasons I was felt free to pick a smaller value of epsilon, though, was because I had already tested the algorithm on the Rocky data set and I knew that the results were, you know, highly accurate. And so I wasn't uncomfortable picking smaller values uh, because I kind of knew, I knew that the results weren't going to, you know, be that much different. Uh, um, but, you know, that was, uh, that was an interesting challenge to, to keep in mind. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, since I'm still standing bet between everyone and dinner, uh, right, I can suggest uh, good topics of conversation for dinner. 
Um, so I guess here's one uh, topic of conversation, right? Uh, um, you know, we've got lots of industry deployments of differential privacy, and that's exciting. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we potentially have the risk that uh, the choices of Epsilon that Google and Apple are making are going to become kind of the de facto standards that guide future implementations or deployments of differential privacy. Um, so, you know, uh, what role should we, you know, as academics play in, uh, play in this discussion? Um, you know, obviously selecting Epsilon uh, is a messy process and it can be context dependent. Uh, um, but, you know, can we actually uh, come up with some sort of standardized guidelines to, you know, give to practitioners who are trying to deploy this stuff? Um, okay, so quick uh, summary of some of the results. You can publish some, you know, basic entropy statistics. Uh, um, and we actually looked at both the original data, which was published, uh, you know, in Bonneau's analysis back in 2012, and repeat the, sanit you know, this uh, analysis on the sanitized data. Um, and in almost all cases, the values that you get are identical. Um, there is, uh, you know, maybe one or two examples uh, where you get a slightly different value. Um, in this case, you know, because uh, there's just not as many Chinese users in the data set, and here we are releasing, you know, this row corresponds to just Chinese users or Chinese language uh, speakers in the data set, uh, right? So our entropy of, you know, this uh, value went from 22.0 to 21.8, so it's still, still close, but uh, at least a little bit, uh, little bit different. Um, so I guess the real interesting choice here was how to partition epsilon, uh, right? So I wanted to have a cumulative budget of epsilon is uh, half, um, and we're releasing lots of different uh, password frequency lists. Um, if you look through each of these lists, uh, you'll f um, find that any individual user can participate in at most 23 of these groups, um, right? So every user participates in the all users data set, uh, but you're either in the male or female uh, data set. Uh, you know, if your default language is Chinese, then your default language is not English. Um, so, you know, each user can affect or impact at most 23 groups. Um, so what we did is we set, uh, you know, epsilon to be 0.25 for the all users category. And for other categories, we set epsilon prime equals epsilon all over 22. So cumulative value is uh, 0.5. Uh, okay, so let me just end with uh, um, an open problem. Uh, so uh, when I actually ran uh, this code, I found that empirically the error I was getting was much lower uh, than uh, the theoretical bounds, um, right? So we have this theoretical upper bound on uh, L1 error, and I found that empirically the error that I was getting uh, tended to be much, much smaller than that. So I'm conjecturing that uh, L1 error actually scales with you know, square root n over square root epsilon instead of square root n over epsilon. Um, it's a small um, but uh, important uh, distinction. Um, and one of the areas where this might be useful is in settings where you might want to set epsilon to be very small, right? For example, if you want to achieve no differential privacy and guarantee that you know, a user can remove, uh, you know, let's say 5,000 edges uh, from a social network, uh, then you might want to set epsilon to be like 0.5 over 5,000. Uh, and in that case, uh, you know, there's a big difference between one over root epsilon and one over epsilon. Um, interestingly, uh, we now have uh, lo some lower bounds on L1 error. Uh, and the lower bounds, or the best known lower bounds that we have, actually match uh, this conjecture. Um, and uh, here's some, yeah. So those are the lower bounds for this particular algorithm? Uh, so this lower bound here is for any uh, differentially private algorithm. Any epsilon zero differentially private algorithm. Yeah, um, yeah, for any epsilon zero differentially private. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this one is for, this lower bound is particularly for the exponential mechanism. Um, so here's, uh, um, right, here's some empirical evidence. Uh, so this is uh, L1 error of the ROCU data set uh, um, plotted uh, versus, you know, one of our square root epsilon. And you can see that this is a, you know, nice linear, uh, linear line. Um, you can also look at the Bitcoin trust network. 
Um, and again, plot error versus one over root epsilon, and it uh, looks pretty linear. Um, now, if you take epsilon values uh, you know, outside this uh, suggested range, then uh, error starts to scale with 1 over epsilon squared um, instead, of, uh, um, n over, um, instead of n over root epsilon. So you know, this is what we uh, actually, uh, actually seem to observe in practice. Uh, right, is, you know, early on, it scales you know, linearly in 1 over root epsilon, and later on, it square, scales linearly in 1 over epsilon squared. Uh, and uh, one, more, uh, one more slide with empirical results just to highlight kind of the power of the exponential mechanism. Um, so this is one of the you know, state of the art uh, um, earlier algorithms for releasing uh, uh, you know, distributions, right, where you just use the Laplace mechanism and then post process. And you know, here's mean squared error. Um, and you might mistake this line down at the bottom for the x-axis, um, but no, this is actually the mean squared error of the exponential mechanism. Um, so, you know, in comparison to uh, previous state-of-the-art, we're getting two to three orders of magnitude improvement. Uh, so it seems, you know, uh, running the exponential mechanism seems to be much better than just post-processing off uh, the noisy data. You know there's a way to make the y-axis on a logarithmic scale, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That would, make the, that would make it less impressive. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, so in conclusion, uh, right, differential privacy, it's really becoming a powerful tool, and it can really enable um, you know, analysis of sensitive data. Um, Yahoo is one example. Uh, we're also collaborating with CoreLogic to release some stats about the LinkedIn breach. Um, and uh, you know, the exponential mechanism uh, might be intractable in general, uh, but in many interesting cases, it's not uh, intractable. Um, you know, so are there other settings in which we could actually run the exponential mechanism? I think that's a valuable question to think about. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, are there uh, cool applications to social networks? Um, so thank you. Epsilon delta, there's a, a sort of a, a very simple algorithm for uh, histograms that would in particular work here, where mm -hmm. you add noise only to the non-zero counts and report those noisy counts that are above a certain threshold of mm. about log one over delta over epsilon. Right. Um, do you know how, did you like look at using that? algorithm in this context? Um, so I didn't. And part of the reason is we wanted to, you know, we didn't have a threshold. We were interested in the whole range of the distribution, you know, even down to the users who picked unique passwords. Uh, um, so yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't look at that particular, um, that particular algorithm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you cut off, um, cut off at a particular threshold, then you are going to um, you, you know, your total L1 error is going to be large, uh, at least for password uh, data sets, because you've got, you know, 30 to 40 percent of people that just pick their own unique password. And if you cut off that, your L1 error is already, you know, 30 percent of the data set uh, minimum. But, but I think the L1 error would be, would just be the second term in the bound that you, because it's the second right. term. Yeah, all, right. the, all the errors are at most log one over delta. The L infinity error is low. Oh, I see. And, and, and okay. zero counts are you have no error at all. And you can and you can still do the project the post processing. Mm. You know, you can still do the same post processing thing that right. came up in the right um, the other work that hey hey. Company okay. And Jerome and yeah. Jerome yeah. But I I don't know if that <laughs> algorithm was like kind of out around uh, out there at the time of this uh, release. Okay. 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 No, I'd be. Okay. Paper of Mars. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I'd be interested to hear uh, hear more about that algorithm, especially you know as we uh, look at collaborating with other groups to release data sets. You know, if it outperforms uh, exponential mechanism, then that's definitely uh, worth uh, worth considering. So I, I guess my other question was, was mm -hmm. related to that was like, do you actually think the algorithm that, like I I didn't follow the, all the details of of how you you know made this tractable, mm -hmm. but is it is it clear it's really like 
just that the delta is really actually positive here? Or is it that you, you know, it's not clear how to prove that this, the sample you're generating is truly from the right distribution, right? It, it's, it, yeah. Um, I mean, we can, I can provably say that, you know, delta is uh, um, negligibly small. Um, no, 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 I know you have not okay. found that. Like, uh, the question is, is it, oh. even, is it possible that with this algorithm it's basically zero? Isn't it oh. Well, well, so yeah, the universe is infinite, so it's not possible to have delta equal zero because we're cutting off, you know, part of the, part of the universe. So the the universe, the universe of outputs is the set of all uh, partitions, right? Uh, um, no, uh, all partitions of some number, right? Uh, um, so in that case, you know, I don't see a way around. Uh, Epsilon delta. Now, if you if you want pure uh, epsilon differential privacy, uh, and um, you're willing to you know publish you know the total number of users in the data set, then yes, there is uh, one can give a polynomial time uh, implementation of the exponential mechanism, uh, even in that setting. Uh, but unfortunately, the only algorithm I know of runs in time n to the one fourth, or sorry, n to the four. Uh, which uh, I tried, uh, you know, I initially thought about trying to run it and quickly uh, gave up. Uh, that was just, uh, you know, out of the practice, out of the question when n is uh, 70 million. Oh, yeah. Right. Then that also has sensitivity one. So you just do luck up from that. Right. It also has a decreasing sequence, you can do the same post policy. And so I was wondering whether you try comparing your exponential mechanism to that, because that actually has much better error characteristics than just doing a plus on the original. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So actually I mean, right, there's a bijection, right? Uh, um, yeah, between uh, you know, partitions and you can just kind of like flip the partition over, uh, right. Uh, um, if you're running the pure exponential mechanism, then there's not going to be any difference uh, um, because because it's a bijection, right? Uh, so you know the number of uh, output partitions at a particular distance is still going to be exactly the same. Um, run Laplace. Um, well, there's still. Oh, I see. Um, if, I think. Um, I think it's still going to be pretty noisy. Um, so I did, uh, I did consider that type of approach. Uh, you know, there's. Uh, um, given, given that you only, have, you only need, you can prove something like you only need uh, noise proportional to right. the number of Right. But the problem is that F1 here is, uh, you know, about 0.7 million. Um, so it's going to reduce, you know, the number of entries somewhat, but it's. You know, you've still got a large number of uh, entries that you're, you know, adding noise to each individual. What is F1 the largest number? Um, F1 is the largest number in the integer partition, right? So, number of users who selected probably password, uh, but we don't uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, all right, let's thank our speaker. All right.